Andreas Niehaus is a professor in Ghent University. He's an expert in judo and manga and biography, and I'm talking to him today. Andreas, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Paul. I'm uh, actually doing quite fine. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we know each other because through your work on um, kind of the manga around martial artists, specifically around Kano and around the, the, the kind of, is it a hagiography or, or is it a, just a biography? It's like, it, it, it's, it's mythic, but it's based in, in fact. I mean, I mean, how do we place the, tell us about the manga around, around Kano. Yes, okay. Um... So as you know, we, we met in Bath where I did a presentation on, on, on the uh, Kano manga and also linking it a bit, little bit to the, the Aikido manga about uh, Ueshiba Morihei. We have the nice picture there in the background, uh, the moment of his enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, I, it's, it's, um, so I was working on biographies uh, anyway, also in my PhD already on Kano Jigoro, and I, I then decided to look at uh, how the manga actually is constructed. And, um, I mean, biographies are always something in between, like like non-fictional texts and fictional texts, right? So they are a, sort of a, a hybrid, hybrid genre. And you were asking uh, about the link to hagiography. Obviously, if, if you look at certain characteristics of how uh, a person is, is is presented in, especially in these manga, and especially in the Ueshiba manga, mm -hmm. um, then uh, there are certain elements that I would say are uh, uh, easily linked to a, a hagiography. And um, I mean, hagiography is also biography, right? So it, 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 it's, it's, it's a very cleaned up and very perfect biography, isn't it? But so, I mean, you um, in the you wrote an article for the journal Martial Arts Studies and you wrote specifically looked at one of one 1987 manga about Kano. Yes. I mean, why did you choose yes. that one in particular? Was that the first one, or is that the most important one? Or, or? well, it's it's um, so yeah, as you already said, it's it's uh, 1987, so it's a crucial moment in the history of judo and especially in the biography of, of Kano Jigoro, because uh, in uh, 1988 you would have the uh, 50th anniversary of its death. Okay. So it's a, a kind of a moment where obviously an institution uh, that wants to remember uh, its founder would take the opportunity to, to publish something like that. And um, it is the first, to my knowledge at least, the first uh, manga on Kano Jigoro. And um, well, if you look at, at the, the, the meaning of, of, of comics uh, in, in, in Europe and in the US at that time, at the 80s, I mean, I always heard from my parents, well, read something serious, do not read these comic things. Um, but already in the 80s in Japan, manga had a totally different meaning, right? So it was already used for educational purposes. So um, what you could expect from a publishing a manga was also kind of an educational aspect that was already in it. And um, you can clearly see that in the, in the manga. I mean, uh, the manga is referring to a lot of um, photos that have been taken during the life of Kano Jigoro, uh, uh, crucial points in his life to research. Uh, there are even footnotes in it. So it, it, it looks like a, a really a, a scientific work, a scholarly work, and uh, in, to a certain extent it is. I mean, it's uh, including so many uh, sources. And mm -hmm. if you are aware of that, um, you, you will realize that. And that's actually why I became interested in the manga because, well, from my own background, I always thought, yeah, it's a manga, so what? So what? Yeah. Uh, but then as soon as you start reading it, it's so fascinating because um, when you already have done your research on Kano, you, you know these Japanese sources already and you know where this is coming from, where that is coming from. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to see it, how it is then included in the manga. And sometimes they're just taking the photographs and including it in the manga yeah. and, and uh, the editors and, and using it that way. And so it, it, it's, it's adding authenticity, right, to, yeah. to the manga. It's not, not just the manga, it's brilliant. So, but that was the main reason why I became interested in, in, in the manga because of its uh, hybridity, basically. Okay, so it's so the the status of uh, it's interesting that you put ma that the manga publication into a historical context because I remember in the nineteen eighties as well, and I was probably the right age to be doing this. I should have been reading serious literature, but it was all kind of comics and new kind of teenage offensive rude comics and, and swearing and political satire but I'm guess so so the manga in Japan would be of the status of I guess the Asterix the Gaul stories did you get them in Germany <laughs> it was about 
and and because it, I mean, I read I read those. They, they were comics, but they were they had some fact in them. They had yes. some, and they were very very kind of patriotic, weren't they? They were about the indomitable goals. There was some historical truth. In them. So like that's that was of a different status. When I was younger and I was reading Asterix the Gaul novels, my parents were fine with that. But like when I was just reading junk trash comic books and magazines <laughs> later on. So the, the manga were of a more serious nature than a trash uh, yeah. comic book, but not literature yet, but but almost. <laughs> so, no, I mean, that makes them also so powerful, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, and it captures your imagination as well, especially when you're at that age, maybe 10 years old and or 10 to like 18 or something, and it really capture your imagination. Yeah. And I guess pull people into a kind of interest in judo, hopefully. I guess that's what they want. That's what the Kodokan wants, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I think, well, it's not easy, obviously, to know what they were aiming at, right? So what was the uh, reader, the ideal reader they were aiming for? I mean, um, if, if you look at how it's constructed and uh, the way the drawings are, it's, it's, it's more directed to a younger audience. So okay. it's, uh, it's different from what you see in the, in the background here, your, your Aikido, the Aikido manga. So um, the, um, um, for example, I have it here. Maybe I can, I can just show it. Yeah. So you have this, uh, these kind of. Uh, so this is young Kano, for example. Um, Kano, yeah. So these drawings are um, really attractive, also for for a younger audience, basically. Yeah. Um, at the same time, you have so difficult terms in it. Uh, where you already have to have some knowledge. But these are then explained by footnotes. And also uh, characters are usually, um, the, the, what you added is uh, a footigana, so reading aids. So that even if you can't read the character, you would still be able to, to read the word because of the reading aid. And uh, if you look again at the nice picture you have in your background, you have no reading aids, right? Uh, so this is a different audience. The okay. Ueshiba manga is uh, looking So tell at. me about the Ueshiba manga then, because he's a different kind of figure. He's not affiliated with a, 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 a big institution like, like the Kodokan. I mean, what's, what, who, who publishes these manga and, and, and what work do you think they're doing? Well, it's also also the manga here is connected to an institution, right? It's uh, connected to the uh, Aikikai, so the headquarter. Uh, so they were involved in the publication as well. But uh, it's it's much more, I would argue, um, oriented towards a specialized readership, people that are all already doing Aikido, or also maybe people that are into new religion, uh, that are into Omotokyo, because Aikido is still very strong within Omotokyo, the new religion. Um, which uh, Kano, uh, which uh, Ueshiba was also a member of, mm -hmm. so they would be interested in, in in that as well, I guess. So, um, and were these principally distributed in Japan? So you go into a, a shop in Japan and you have different set. Would they be in a martial arts section, or would you find them in a different? I mean, would, would, actually, I would... don't know. I, I didn't. I, I I didn't check to be honest uh, whether it uh, would be available. I mean. Um, the, the, the Kano manga, it's quite a, a big publisher, so you would certainly have that in, in, in shops at that time, in the 80s, I, I guess. Uh, it's also hardcover, so it's, 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 uh, the quality is, is better than that one of the uh, Ueshiba manga. Okay. But uh, uh, to be honest, I haven't checked. I just ordered it online. Oh, okay, okay. So you, but, you, but, heard, uh, you heard about them and then ordered them online? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. It would be interesting research, wouldn't it, to find out I mean, it would be quite easy research to just say, so in the 80s, where did you get these things? And like, what yeah. were the shops like? <laughs> were they in different sections? I mean, that would be, it would be interesting to find out the status of them in terms of how they're positioned within a shop, within a, or, yes. or a, 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 a store somewhere. Very interesting. Yeah, but I mean, today it's, it's easy. The, the, the uh, Kano manga you can either uh, buy online, uh, although um, I bought my one uh, secondhand in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, in Kanda. But um, what is also happening with the uh, Kano manga is that uh, you already have a digital version, a new one. And that's obviously great, right? Uh, that also shows, I mean, this, these are professional publishers. If there is no interest, you would not publish it again uh, in digital. But um, it has been published, so um, it's, it's available now. Yeah, it's having yeah. new iterations and new, new yeah. life forms. Okay, interesting. I, want, I mean, we could find out it would be, would be possible to find out what kind of sales they get as well, wouldn't it? I mean, we could do some. Yeah, research. it's possible. Yeah, yes, yes. Ah, interesting. So let's go back to judo then. So you, I'm guessing, now I don't know this, 
we have never had this conversation, but I'm guessing you got into judo as a child and because you did your PhD research, your dissertation on judo, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right, yes. On, so on, tell me uh, the narrative, you were a judo practitioner and you just became more interested in in the status of judo or the history of judo? Yeah. No, actually, it, yeah, kind of. So, so I started with judo, then uh, later turned towards karate. And uh, then when I started at that university, I also uh, then additionally did, uh, while still uh, teaching karate, I also did Aikido. Okay. So I started with Aikido then and then continued it also when I was in Japan. So but, but um, my interest actually was from the beginning, it was a uh, myth. Okay. Uh, of the founders of these yeah. martial arts because you see all these patterns coming back again and again and again um, and um, so you, you have this um, this guy already in the Meiji period um, what was his name again uh, I think uh, Kubota Sugane was his name um, he was a, uh, a teacher I guess also at, at the Kobusho the military academy in uh, in Japan in the Meiji period mm -hmm. and uh, he in I think it was in the 1960s he already wrote uh, these people that claim that they have learned their martial arts in a dream uh, that they have learned martial arts from Tengu these these mountain goblins they are all liars yes. and uh, so I was really interested in that and it so these, these kind of narratives that you have, and it was not about saying, well, it's true or not. I mean, that's not interesting. Uh, it's interesting why something is said in a way it is said. So how the narrative is, 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 is constructed. And so I was interested in that. And uh, so I, I started to write my PhD about that. But then I realized, okay, Kano Jigoro, and I started with him. And I said, oh, that's already a lot. And then I got stuck with him. And, and, and because I realized there was nothing about him so far. Um, at least not uh, on, on from a scientific scholarly point of view, because what all these there are a lot of biographies, right? Uh, but they are all written from within the system. Yes. And by that time, I already had stopped. It was just a childhood memory, nothing more. And so, uh, yeah. and then I started uh, working on that. Okay. So I mean, I mean, I'm teaching. Um film studies at the moment. I teach a, call, a module called Film and Cultural Theory, and we just looked at The Last Samurai, you know, the, the Tom yeah. Cruise film, and, and not because it's a good film, but because um, it teaches the students about alienation, modernity, and then all, kind of Orientalism in it. And I, and I have to tell them every year, we're not we don't care about historical fact like we you know like if you search in youtube like 10 things the director got wrong with like feudal or maybe yeah. you read japan it's like we don't care we have to ask why like how does what is the semiotic structure here how does it work why does it like why are we interested in that like what pleasures yeah. does it give so what what do you find with the the structures of narratives around these historical figures i mean are there continuities across all the figures, the founding figures in narrative structures? What, what would be the main features, do you think? Yes, yes, you have, you have um, a lot of uh, commonalities, right? Uh, I, I think, for example, uh, in, in both Kano Jigoro and uh, Ueshiba, there is a link to, to not just, or there is the idea to not only limit life to the institution, either to the Kodokan or the Aikikai, but it's also to link it to a, a greater, greater narrative of the nation. Mm. So in, in, in both biographies, you see that, how they are connected to the history of the nation and how they are constructed as being true patriots. Then there's obviously the link to, to, to the martial arts tradition they want to be placed in. Uh, that's important. But, but maybe one, one clear thing that comes back in both, and it's very obvious, is the, uh, it's called uh, Yuvamushi narrative. So it's the narrative of um, a weakling. So both are seen as, as rather weak uh, yeah. during their childhood. Yeah. And it is then the martial art that helps them to become uh, a stronger and uh, become uh, what they have become later. It's obviously a, a sort of uh, argument that, that verifies also, and uh, not only verifies, but also uh, legitimizes the institution afterwards, yeah. right? So he, the, the master became strong because of the training of judo, of Aikido, and, and you can do the same. Uh, yeah. That's what we stand for. And it will make you a moral national subject. Oh, yes. Yeah, obviously. So, so, yeah, that's... And that's, that's, that's a kind of idea that, that continues to this day. And I wonder, just, I mean, a, a speculation. Do you think that 
institutions like you have it with like Taekwondo in South Korea and you, you have it with, I guess you still have it with Japanese institutions and they get connected with a kind of national discourse. Do you think mm. that that emerges organically from the practice where the practitioners, the teachers and it founders really do think that it makes the students more moral mm. or is it, can, is it because an institution must be connected with larger systems of justification and, and, and like and value so they'll say, mm. these people that we produce are, are good national subjects. And that's not, they don't necessarily believe that. Yeah. That's just the public image because that's, what do you think? I mean, what's, do you think there's truth in the, in the upstanding moral subject myth? Yeah. Well, well, actually, actually we, we obviously cannot know what people think, right? Yeah. I can, I can claim A, but I think B. So um, we, we cannot know that. But I think that, that, that uh, martial art practice uh, and the way or the way it is practiced today uh, in certain schools is a, a, a brilliant tool to realize certain uh, patriotic goals. I mean, if you, if you look only at, at, at uh, uh, karate and how karate was transformed in uh, the early 20th century from what it was in Okinawa uh, into uh, what we have today, which is a, a, on the one hand, it's obviously a process of spotification, but it's also a process of Japanization. Mm -hmm. So where suddenly uh, this karate, which was trained in small groups, suddenly became trained in large groups. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually looking more like military training already. And uh, it became connected to, to totally different values than, than before. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, that's, that's also interesting how these, these values that were valid in a certain time are linked to martial arts. Mm -hmm. um, and and in, in a certain way, martial arts just just empty, right? Uh, it's, it's an empty box. It says martial arts. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, a vagueness to it. And you can fill the, this kind of void, the, the vagueness with whatever you want, basically. Yeah. And you can claim it, it's all about humanity. Okay, but then define humanity. Well, it's, it's about um, uh, Germans ruling the world. That's humanity. So you can, all, you can put that in, into that. And, and, and that, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. also it's, dangerous, I mean, obviously. I was thinking that the, 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 the kara of karate, and it, I was once at a conference and, and this, you know, sometimes like, male academics get into like a bit of a pissing competition with each other <laughs> and and this older professor was going ah and he, he was very interested in the notion of the void and the notion of the empty at the time and he was saying ah but did you know that the kara of karate means empty and i said yeah it does but it didn't originally it originally it meant it meant china right and they just changed they nationalized it so that void that emptiness is actually japanese nationalism like the the yeah. the, the wiping and so that i mean that's a kind of a beautiful image isn't it of the empty of the karate yes it's a, a actually, perfect example yeah it's actually yeah, it, it ideology <laughs> yes but it's also nice to see how something was then came from Japan back to Okinawa, right? So the, it was then needed a conference in Okinawa. I think it was 1936 or so, where then they decided, oh yeah, it was that year. And, and 25th of October, if I remember correctly, okay. that, that we will accept kara okay. <laughs> as uh, emptiness. But, uh, but what, what I was just reminded when you, when you said that is that what, what we also, um, and that what, what you exactly did now is we, we, we do not take into account also um, our own history as scholars and um, that we are also uh, in a certain tradition, right? And what you just said, the Zen Buddhist uh, tradition is, is one of the aspects that's so striking, right? So a lot of scholars working on martial arts, they're just focusing, and also popular literature, obviously, focusing on Zen Buddhism. So martial arts is all Zen Buddhism, but, but yes. well, no, yes. no. If we look at Herigel or, or uh, Nitobe, Naso, okay, that's where it's coming from. But when we look at it uh, more in a, from a historical perspective, we can see where it's coming, when it's coming uh, into the discourse and, and why it's suddenly stressed, especially in a Western discourse, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's exactly what you said. Yeah, we, you've got to be careful of projection and confirmation bias and so on, which, is, which relates to, I guess, so I think everyone knows not everyone, lots of people know about the, the transformations that inevitably happened in the wake of the Second World War. So, I mean, if we simplify in the extreme, then in, in the run-up to the, to the Second World War, 
uh, Japan was very expansionist and nationalist and kind of aggressive and, and militarist. And then after the Second World War, when, when it was effectively occupied by the United States, they had to re-present, they had to reconstruct and represent martial arts. Yeah. So how much of, say, if we take the judo philosophy, if we take Kano's philosophy uh, 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 about, you know, the, the narrative about judo being a more refined and genteel version of jujitsu, it's like taking the, yeah. it's, it's the softness and pliability. How much of that is a post-World War II projection back, which says judo's fine, we, it's fine. Don't worry about judo ideologically. There's no military expansionism here. It, I mean, how much? Yeah. It, what happened in that transformation in the wake of the Second World War? I mean, did the judo ideology become more aggressive or more nationalist in the run-up to the Second World War or during it? I mean, how can we verify that? What do you What do you think about changes within the discourse yeah. of judo? So yeah, it, it's really difficult. Uh, it really is. And I mean, uh, you also know uh, Professor Sakawe from from Hirotsubashi University, and he really um, he he wrote uh, an article also on how actually the idea of martial arts in general in Japan changed from uh, first being a martial art, then then being educational, and then as you said, militaristic, and then back to educational. And nowadays, it's it's, it's again more back to something spiritual, right? Uh, so um, for, for judo, I think for, for me, the answer is, is difficult. Um, and it, it, it's also heavily discussed and, and, and within uh, the circle of, of judo researchers. Mm. So I, I will just tell you my point of view. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when, when Kano was developing uh, judo in, uh, in the uh, 80s of uh, the, the uh, of the 19th century mm. so you already have this kind of very strong patriotic element in it mm. at that time however japan was in a position where it was threatened by western powers right so uh, this kind of patriotic approach to, to judo was something different from what is happening later Mm. So there it was like, okay, we have to be strong against uh, foreign forces and, and they might take over and, and, and so on and so on. Then, so uh, that changed uh, then in, in the later period. Well, Kano died in, in 38, so we might not know mm. what, he, what his ideas really were. Um, he, he obviously was involved in, in, in the Olympic movement. So he was the first Asian member within the IOC and he was a, a really strong supporter of that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, you, you often hear that, that he was a pacifist. He certainly was not a pacifist because he was not about, uh, he was not in favor of uh, dismantling, for example, army. No, uh, he was more a, a person that says, well, we all need strong armies. It, it guarantees safety. Yeah. His, however, uh, when we see this um, negative approach to China um, that you already mentioned in the term Kara, and that's, that's just one example, mm -hmm. but it was a general political uh, sphere at that time, right? In the in the 30s and already starting in the 20s, but then kicking in certainly with 31. So uh, what's happening is that uh, uh, he is actually um, having he's having a, a very positive image of China and uh, and arguing that oh China we have learned so much from China Japan has taken over so many things from China and and now we are in a position where we where we can teach China, where we teach China but it's a kind of a give and take so uh, there are some nice articles uh, of him about that and then um, so then later obviously uh, Judah certainly was integrated into uh, the whole militarization of, of, of Japanese society uh, at that time also judo at that time looked totally different right so you had kicks and you had punches which are nowadays excluded from from judo and and so we're not even talking about in terms of technique about the same judo um yes. so so it's one word but it means very different things at very different times i guess yes and i, I, yes, I wonder exactly. if um how much it, things might change in the wake of of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, I'm thinking about, so a few years ago, I tried judo, but I learned very quickly that I was too old to start judo. <laughs> like, maybe 20 years ago, maybe. But even then, yeah. I think I would have been at the upper. But the, a, a friend of mine, he said that he used to do a, a different, it wasn't like a Kodokan judo, it wasn't an Olympic type judo. It was, it was a thing that was called Zen judo, where they were really, mm. really compliant with each other. So, 
So oh, yes. be more closer to a kind of Aikido aesthetic of it's like, I'm going to do this throw, just go with it. Like don't, so mm. there was no resistance and no like, Ugh. Um, and that was a different world. And we used to laugh about that. You know, I would come back and say, oh my God, I can't move. And it was a week ago, I still can't. And he's like, oh yeah, we never got that. We just bounced around <laughs> on top of mats and things. But I wonder what do you think might happen to these, to these well, sports activities? I, I think I think they might become more health focused and more uh, based on things like breathing and posture and stuff because of the, the pandemic. What do you think the transformations might be? I'm not sure, actually, I have to admit, because, uh, I mean, you already have these these uh, parallels, right? You have left um, in, in Judo or also in, in Aikido or also in Karate, you have styles that are more focusing on health, that are more focusing on uh, harmony and these kind of movements, while at the same time, you have a more sportified branch that are really um, just doing uh, sort of a sports martial arts, or then again, you have these that are more oriented towards combat, right? Yeah. So um, you already have the entire market present uh, for uh, different, yeah. for what people look for. And you might even change when you get older to a different form because you, you notice that, uh, okay, if you are thrown in a judo throw, it hurts. So yeah. you might either turn towards a style that is more focusing on kata, for example, yeah. um, which is, is nicer. So I'm not sure whether that this is, well, the um, COVID-19 uh, will have a huge influence on that. But what, what I fear is that, um, I mean, contact sport at the moment is, uh, at least in Belgium, I guess in, in England also, it, it's prohibited, right? So you, you cannot actually train. So I'm, I'm kind of worried about the next generation or um, pupils that are uh, on a, in a stage where they really have to, to develop and it's not possible because... I mean, it's a difference when you train alone yeah. um, and, and you get maybe feedback from a master or, or so, but yeah, or training outside, uh, something, things cannot be done. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of worried about that element. Yeah. I, I and mean, not to I speak worry... of the financial impact. Yeah. For those. I, I worry right. about the, because I mean, so you've got three, if you, if you know about three arts, like in a very, very, very practical lived way. So you know about judo and you know about karate and you know about Aikido. I can see that of those three, in terms of, let's say we don't get a vaccine. Let's say we don't get definitively good treatments. That mean you, you get infected, you get cured. Like, let's just yeah. say that that doesn't happen. I think that of those three, the thing that's most likely to, to survive would be karate because that's that's yeah. you can do solo kata you can do distance you can do your bow yeah. staff but i and aikido has staffs and whatnot as well but but an aikido you can do distance locks you can you can throw people with the wrist and and so on judo yeah. i mean judo has a very strong uh, institutional base and it has its olympic status but in terms of parents driving their children to judo like mm -hmm. in these times i think that's going to fall off rapidly yeah. i mean do you think that, that that participation i mean we have new things like cobra kai comes out and remythologizes karate and then and then but and judo has the, the kodokan and the olympics but i mean what happens to to close contact sports like judo or brazilian jiu-jitsu or so what do you think yeah well, if it's only a short phase, I mean, okay, here we go. Then, uh, uh, in my opinion, also, I think humans are not really uh, a breed that is learning uh, mm -hmm. from mistakes. So I, I, I think we just go back to normal. Uh, capitalism will just uh, pick up where it left before destruction of rainforests. Well, it's 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 even uh, even now it's, it's it's more than ever before. So um, in, in, in well, that's my opinion. Eh? So I have no. Uh, uh, whatsoever yeah. but i think it will just pick up where it was before um if it's staying i i think the scenario that you were painting um might become uh, a reality so that these uh, close uh, contact sports they might uh, uh, disappear and yeah. the dojos will disappear right and and I, I also wonder how many dojos will survive this period um, yeah. so if you depend on that as a livelihood i mean yeah, yeah I, I mean yeah i think a lot of practices Things like, say if with things like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or maybe Judo, you can maintain your a kind of similar activity by slip moving to something more like yoga. And if you look mm -hmm. at what a lot of clubs have switched to, they've switched to kind of individual, more like yoga type aerobics type practices. But 
Yeah, let's let's yeah, talk about yeah, something. But... That, let's talk about something you do know about, definitely, definitively. What more can we expect in terms of your research around judo and martial arts? What other publications do we have to look forward to? What are you working on next? Oh, actually, yeah. So at, at the moment, I'm I'm whoa. Um, wait. So <laughs> as you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Japanologist, right? Yeah. So I'm not only in into to martial arts, but uh, um, I, I approach sports and uh, um, martial arts from a, a Japanologist's point of view. So uh, first of all, together with Japanese colleagues, I will be publishing on, on narratives in uh, Japanese Olympics. Uh, so that will be a, a book coming out next week. It's an edited volume on, on uh, the Olympics in Japan. Then um, I'm, I'm also working at the moment on, on, on Aikido and also uh, a little bit connected to, to um, what I have done in, in Bath, but it's, it's taking another turn now. So I'm looking at, at the, uh, on the one hand, on, on biography mm -hmm. uh, of uh, Ueshiba on the one hand, how it is, what the narrative is, especially certain key moments in his life. Yeah. And, and try to connect that to a broader picture of Japanese history and how, for example, um, so there's this episode where he is in, um, when was that? I think in 1912 or so, he's moving to, to Hokkaido uh, to become a farmer and how that is actually connected to a colonial policy in Japan that led to the extinction or basically extinction of Ainu culture uh, in, uh, so how that can be included in that. And it's, while in the biographies you see, well, he went to Hokkaido and, and uh, he, um, so there were bears following him very friendly, and he was a, he also got then this name, um, King of Shirataki or something, the, the village where he was, so all his greatness, uh, not mentioning that actually he was part of a bigger movement, which already started uh, 1875 or so, where um, settler militias were moved to Hokkaido to, and you have this idea at that time of, of, of um, the, the, the empty land, the landscape that just have to be conquered by the Japanese. So it's, it's very American in a way also, right? Like the Indians. So he's part of that. Um, um, and it's not just like, oh yeah, he's, he's starting also martial arts there, the Daito Ryu. And um, so he's supporting other farmers. No, it's, it's part of a bigger thing, uh, which is colonialism. Um, and at the same, then looking at something like um, his, his trip to Mongolia, in um, uh, in the twenties, <laughs> and uh, with, with uh, the founder of the Omotokyo uh, new religion, uh, Degochi Onisaburo, where they wanted to have a uh, establish a, a holy country, and they, they had a holy army. Uh, they wanted to have, and, and also that uh, you can place it fantastically in a context of of, of colonialism and imperialism of, of of Japan at that time, and. Um, and, and, and while obviously within Aikido circles, it's no, 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 he was just uh, trying to, to spread his Aikido and it was, uh, was not aware of any political implications. I, I, I doubt that, seriously. So I'm looking at that on the one hand, but then also you have this, how is it connected to techniques and how is it connected to then um, his um, metaphysics? Um, okay. So, uh, and, and this is something I'm, I'm working on at the moment as well. Fabulous, and will that be a book, or will that be chapters or articles? Or oh, only only a chapter uh, article. I mean, uh, okay. unfortunately, uh, due to other obligations. I mean, uh, okay, writing a book would be uh, uh, too hard at the moment. I think that that sounds absolutely absolutely fascinating and fabulous. Will it be in English, or will it be in? It will be in English. Okay. So I gave a a, a, a talk um, last year in uh, in Kalamazoo. For that, and then also next year, the conference in, in Lausanne, I will also uh, try to present uh, the, the newest uh, results from that research. So, excellent, excellent, excellent. So, just I guess one last thing I mean, so you're a Japanologist um, and you've worked, so you spent a lot of time in Japan, you're researching Japanese culture and Japanese sport, Japanese martial arts. You've also worked uh, in, in the, the German language uh, field of martial arts studies. I mean, what kind of conversations do you think that we need to be happening, uh, having across these different linguistic contexts? Because a lot of scholars working in Japanese, they're not, they're, they're not 
able to, it's not translated into English and I don't know if it's translated no. into German and a lot of these academics like English isn't a second language of theirs they might be able to read it but it's not necessarily taught as a compulsory subject at school right so what what are we missing across the two contexts what do you think is the really an interesting difference between the Japanese study of Japanese martial arts and the the English language or German language study of Japanese martial arts yeah so um well, first of all, as you said already, I mean, um, not many publications of Japanese authors are available in English or in, in German, which is a pity, I think, because um, we have some really, really good uh, uh, authors. And I mean, you, you had this conference in Bath, right, where some of our uh, Japanese college, colleagues uh, presented, and they really have uh, something to say. I mean, their access to, to primary sources is so good. And um, they, they exactly know where to find these sources, they can analyze these sources. And um, so it's, it's, it's really something that uh, I, for example, as a Japanologist, I, I need a lot of time to, to first locate these sources and then analyze these sources. Um, while um, for um, our colleagues, it's, it's much easier. Um, also, what I, I really um, think is that lately, there's a, a, a development in Japan where more and more uh, scholars that are not connected to martial arts circles are publishing and that's really a, a plus right mm -hmm. so you get a perspective where um, the author is not writing about Kano Jigoro for example and always um, claim or um, saying well Kano sensei yeah. or Ueshiba yeah. sensei in, 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 the, in the work uh, yeah. that already shows that you are biased if you if you call someone yeah, yeah. sensei in your yeah. in your work so that's 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 changing so you have more and more japanese scholars that are um approaching um martial arts from another perspective and i really think we, we, we should um well first of all translate it more but yeah. that takes money and and time to do that to get it uh, uh, get it done um but um yes i think yeah yeah, no, that, that's, that's really interesting. That's great. And it's great to hear that you are planning to um, present at our next conference in Lausanne. Hopefully... Well, if it's oh, accepted. <laughs> if it's, well, if it's accepted, um, uh, I'll, I'll have a word with someone on, on the scientific committee and say, this, this guy's reliable. Let's, let's, let's take a chance on him. Uh, <laughs> um, and if if we're allowed to have a face-to-face -face conference if, if the world um, settles down and we can go back to business as usual <laughs> flying <laughs> destroying the ozone good. layer <laughs> but i've taken up um a lot of your time today so um, i'm going to say andreas thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today no thanks for inviting me for the talk and it was great to see you again and I really hope that we will see each other again in, in Lausanne then. Okay, uh, thank you. In summer.